Welcome to AAUW Connections. We are going to be talking about spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, the leading genetic killer of children under two. One in 40 are carriers of this disease, and one in 6,000 births are affected. It doesn't matter what ethnicity, race, or gender, and it affects a child's ability to crawl, sit, walk, swallow, and breathe. Joining me tonight are people who are personally involved with SMA. We have Pat and Dick Wolf, who have a granddaughter, Maddie, who has spinal muscular atrophy type 2. Sharia, mother of Soham Shah, they are here joining us, and Soham has type 2. And I'm Linda Shively. My daughter Jessica had type 1. What causes SMA? Well, Linda, let me uh, <clears throat> take a shot at that. Let's start with the muscles we're referring to. These are the muscles that come off the core of our body. Those would be the muscles in our legs, our arms, our neck, our back, and our diaphragm. Now, like all muscles, these muscles are controlled by nerves. In their case, this nerve is called the motor neuron. It starts in the spinal column, and it projects long arms out to these muscles called axons to, to control them. Now, motor neurons, like all nerves, need a protein to stay healthy. In their case, that protein is, is produced by the SMN1 gene. Now, if that gene is missing or not functioning properly, as is the case with SMA individuals, then there's an insufficient amount of protein to keep that nerve healthy, and the motor neuron shrinks and dies. Hmm. Now, when that happens, the muscles they control shrink or atrophy, and hence the name of this disease, spinal muscular atrophy. So that sounds like it could be pretty bad. It can, but let's, let me say a few more things. There's a, there's a, there's a good side to this, to this disease, and that is that there's a backup gene called SMN2. And that gene will produce a small amount of the protein that's needed to keep these nerves healthy. And it can occur in multiple copies in our bodies. So that's what gives rise to the variations in, of this disease, where type 1 individuals have very limited muscle control, but a type 4 SMA individual may have near normal muscle control all the way through youth, but as they reach adulthood, their muscles weaken. Okay. Well, how does one get SMA? So that's the genetics of it, but, but how does one end up with it? Well, we have a graphic here. Let's put it up and take a look. And let's start with the parents. We all inherit two sets of genes, one from our mother and one from our father. Mm -hmm. Now, in the case of SMA, as long as one of those sets of genes has a good SMN1 gene in it, we will not be affected with SMA. But if the other set of genes does not have a good SMN1 gene, then that person's a carrier. But the now, carrier doesn't actually have But the SMN. carrier doesn't okay. have it because the SMN1 dominates, and as long as they have one, they're okay. But the other set of genes doesn't have it, so they're a carrier. Now, when you put two carriers together and they mate and have offspring, you have the following possibilities for their offspring, as we see here in the graphic. There's a 25% chance that that offspring will not be affected with SMA, nor will they be a carrier. But there's a 50% chance they'll be a carrier, and there's a 25% chance that the child will be affected with SMA. So one in four. One in 40 people are carriers, and if you do the math now and start with the parents who each have a one in 40 chance of being a carrier, and then they have a 25% chance of having a child with SMA, we arrive at that statistic you mentioned that one in 6,000 births are SMA affected. So a family could have kids that have SMA and kids that don't. Absolutely, and that's the case in our situation where our granddaughter is SMA type 2, but her sister is a carrier but not affected. Okay. And so how did you first 
find out about SMA? What what led you to what signs did you see? I know with Jessica, she was not able to really keep her head up, and the, when you bounce the little baby, her legs wouldn't support her anymore, and so the doctor did a blood test. But Sharia, what about, how did you guys find out? So same, um, when he was around four, five months, six months, he wasn't meeting up the gross motor skills, like he wasn't sitting up, and he wasn't, like you said, when you put him in like a standing position or you bounce him on your lap, he wouldn't take weight on his legs. But we were like first time parents, we had no idea yeah. that something's wrong. And uh, eventually we, uh, we went to a neurologist, a pediatric neurologist, and they said, let's do the blood test. And it, it was SMA. So I think the the signals were the gross motor skills. Mm -hmm. And so are there tests, that, obviously there's a blood test that can be done once a child is here. Are there tests that are being done prenatally? And we can test for carriers, mm -hmm. and I think they can test prenatally if they know to look for it, right? Is that there are prenatal, prenatal tests, yes, that's correct. One of the issues with SMA is since we don't have a cure, um, most states don't do the testing because there's not a cure, and so mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. covered. But. So if you know if you know that you have it in your family, then you can get tested for it. But otherwise, you probably wouldn't. Right. Okay. Well, obviously, Soham is a lot older than two. And what when? Did he start driving around in his power chair? So when I was about five, I started to move my power chair, but I did not really move my power chair. I usually just sat in in the chair, in the power chair, like a normal chair. But my, my dad put leaves on the ground, and then when I saw those uh, leaves, I started to crush them. So dad <laughs> would go to the other neighbor's house and grab a bunch of leaves, put them on the ground and wait for me to crush them all. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Soham, actually he said he started when he was five, but he started way before that. He was around two, two and a half when we got the power chair and he wasn't too motivated to drive. So the only thing he, what that would motivate him was the dry leaves. If the making the sound of the crushing them, he would love that. So we would like put piles of uh, dry leaves on the road and <laughs> encourage him to drive. What, whatever worked. Yes, and right. it worked. And I think uh, he actually really started uh, using the power chair more when he started kindergarten. So, so what are the other challenges having a power chair? So SMA can affect physically, but also emotionally. Mm -hmm. Let, she's asking first about power chair challenges. So do you have anything special in your house? or? Yes, we have something called um, a potty chair, where instead of going on a normal toilet, we go on something called a potty chair, which drags oh. onto the toilet. You want me to explain that better? No. <laughs> so what he's saying is uh, because of the mobility issues, uh, there are a lot of challenges and um, our house is, we're very blessed that it's uh, uh, accessible. It's accessible. Uh, we have ramps in the house and uh, a roll-in shower where he can just roll in to the bathroom and have a shower or um, shower chair. So that, that those are some of the things. But your question was challenges. And accessibility is a big challenge uh, everywhere. In home, we can address it because it's in our control, but when it's outside in the public places, that's easy too because most of them are accessible. But whenever we have to plan a trip, we have to really plan in advance, make sure, call ahead of time, ask them if, what are the, you know, are there ramps, are there, you know, where's the exit, where, are there bathrooms, that kind of thing. So planning ahead. And that is very helpful. And I think the biggest challenge we face with the accessibility is when we go to friends or relatives' house. Because you know nobody's house are like really designed for a power wheelchair. So, but over the time we'll learn to be creative and <laughs> deal with it case by case. 
And our, so I, oh, go ahead. Now our uh, granddaughter Madison had some of the same. She was fortunate to have a one-story home that yes. starts out well, mm -hmm. but they had to make quite a few adaptions to the house, such as making the bathroom larger so that she could maneuver and she can get under the sink. She also has the roll-in shower, shower mm -hmm. which is essential as she's getting bigger. Right. Yeah. Um, and um, well, I, I wanted yeah. to talk about some of the other health issues that SMA causes. I know there's respiratory challenges and s since swallowing is an issue, there's feeding challenges. Mm -hmm. Have you had to deal with that? I know Jessica had to have a feeding too. Yes. And, and uh, we also uh, had to deal with that and Soham does have a feeding too. He gets where he gets all his nutrition needs met. But he likes to try food, he likes to taste, so he does that. And he's a, actually, he has better taste buds than Mitesh or I, uh, both of us. He can tell, tell us, oh, this has this, or this tastes this. But uh, yeah, all his nutrition is mainly through the G-tube, though. Madison doesn't have a G-tube. She's able to eat and maintain her strength. But the one concern with her is when she gets sick, she can very quickly get extremely sick. Mm -hmm. A slight cold can go into pneumonia, hospital stays, ICU, mm -hmm. and those are really scary times mm -hmm. See, for the I family. I mentioned earlier that these muscles are, one of them are the diaphragm. And SMA individuals don't clear their lungs as completely as, mm -hmm. as we do. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that makes them susceptible to pneumonia. So mm -hmm. colds can move into pneumonia quite quick, easily with an right. SMA individual. And they're not able to cough to clear the secretions. Mm -hmm. Correct. So they have all sorts of special equipment yes. to be able to do that. And yes, on a daily basis, not even when they're sick, actually. Uh, Soham needs, and he gets two breathing treatments every day, twice mm -hmm. a day, on a normal day, to just keep it clean and keep his lungs open and free of secretions. So that's right. I mean, it's, it's an extensive breathing treatment, yes. And with all of the medical things and hospital visits, do you do it all yourself, or are you? Do you have anybody that can help you in some way? Do you over the it? time uh, we have been fortunate. In the initially it was us doing everything, but now over the time, there we have found a lot of resources, and we do have some nursing help that is available. So it is out there, and uh, you can get nursing through your insurance, so which is helpful. Well, Pat, I know there were some things you were talking about Maddie, and we have a video to show about Maddie that I think explains some of the challenges and joys that she's going through. And let's go ahead and exactly. show that now. In this video, Maddie is six years old. Yes, Maddie is six years old in this video. Speed, speed. Mommy, Doris. Whenever she gets a chance, she's going up to full speed and going as quickly as she can. I really like to get around and stuff and not just sit somewhere and play. Now I'll turn the go-go pets off. Getting to know Madison Wolf is easy if you can keep up with her. She's about the happiest, most social six-year-old little girl you'll ever find. She loves to play with her friends. She loves to be on the go all the time. I guess if you teach somebody how to drive when they're two years old, they become a pretty good driver. At the age most kids learn to walk, Madison was diagnosed with spinal muscular atrophy. Ryan and Angel help others learn about SMA by involving Madison with everyday kid stuff, which sometimes prompts curiosity. Kids are very honest and they have a lot of questions. And, you know, we're very open. We're, you know, we tell them, ask her, she'll tell you. She'll always tell them, my muscles just aren't as strong as yours. And then moves on to the next subject. Ariel came and skipped. I think a lot of misconceptions happen just seeing somebody in a wheelchair and you immediately think, oh, they may not be very intelligent or you know, they may not be able to do what you and I do. So it's fun just to, to watch her because she finds a way to be involved with whatever is happening. That means you might find Maddie and little sister Ella involved in any activity under the sun. She has become the rollerblade queen. Her friends get on the rollerblades and she becomes the driver. They ask if they can get the rollerblades on and hold on to my chair. They all grab onto the chair and go flying down the block. <laughs> Swimming is something we all enjoy because she is really free. She can move around in the pool. Good job, you're doing it. You're almost at the other end. 
One activity she can't wait to tackle is MDA summer camp. She's been ready for MDA camp for six years, to be honest with you, and we, uh, we're always uh, kind of the countdown, you know, hey, two months and you're going to get to go to camp, and she couldn't wait, and we're very excited, and unfortunately, uh, she got sick right prior to camp this year and wasn't able to go. A bacterial infection led to a collapsed lung and a traumatizing five-week hospital stay. Without those individuals that we know through the SMA and MDA communities, I'm not sure how we would have made it through that stay. Mom, stuck. Madison knows she'll have other opportunities to go to summer camp. For the long term, the Wolf family has a more challenging goal. She used to always say, I wish I could walk. I wish I could walk. And it is still heartbreaking, I mean, to even hear her say that. And she doesn't ask it so much these days, um, but she still does, you know, and I guess that's our, our goal and our wish is that there would, they would find a cure. Madison is now 11 years old. You saw her as a six-year-old. She's very bright and happy, and she's a very social young lady. She attends um, public schools, and she does have a full-time aide who helps lift things and carry things for her and make sure that the path is clear so she can maneuver through her classroom and the school. She's, um, she plays drums in the school band. She's the student body treasurer, and she's active in her Girl Scout troop and she's also the MDA ambassador so for her state. So cognitively, so. SMA doesn't really have an effect. It's not at purely, all. Yeah, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. Right. And I know that there are other challenges that we haven't talked about, and respiratory issues, spinal issues. I know mm -hmm. there are surgeries that, fusions that have happened in both of your families right. that mm -hmm. if you want to it's a, <clears throat> let me lead into that by reminding us that back muscles keep our vertebrae straight. Mm -hmm. Those are obviously muscles that are affected with SMA individuals. So scoliosis is one of the things that, that comes on in an early age with SMA individuals. And so you probably can comment about what they do to right. take, take care of that. So basically the scoliosis, the spine kind of becomes like an S shape. So to make, to, and, and if we let it be that way, it will eventually affect the breathing. So to avoid that, uh, uh, there is uh, something called, there are two different ways of kind of straightening the spine. Mm -hmm. And uh, that helps kind of, they put rods in and to straighten the spine. So that helps with the, um, to making the posture, posture mm -hmm. and straightening the spine, which helps with opening up the breathing and lungs and it affects with, it ha really helps with that. Definitely, Matt, Maddie, actually overnight she grew six inches after <laughs> her surgery, so her headrest had to be raised wow. that much. Wow, yes. that, that's kind of a nice boost. And, yes. mm -hmm. But then of course that's how tall they are forever. Right. And, uh, well yeah. actually Madison has growing rods. So okay. every six months they examine and they've already once extended the rods. So um, she will continue to grow. Okay. Yeah, it's a significant surgery yes. to put the rods in, mm -hmm. but to adjust them, it's a very minor surgery. Okay. And what about hobbies and fun things? I know we just saw in the video Maddie doing all sorts of activities. So, Hum, what do you do? You do dancing and I like video games a lot. Video games. Mm -hmm. And I like to dance. What kind, of, what kind of dancing do you do? It's like Indian dance. Bollywood In, dancing, right? Yeah. Bollywood dancing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But, Soham enjoys Bollywood dancing. Soham and I actually, we both like Bollywood dancing and t he takes part in, um, with other kids uh, in an organization called Gina mm -hmm. and uh, he performs twice a year for that. So he likes that. He used to play power wheelchair soccer and was on the San Jose Rockets team up until last year. How um, fun. Yeah, fun. that is a lot of fun, and he's planning to go back, right, Sohan? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> well, Who knows? Who knows? We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Well, what, what is being done? We've heard the challenges that exist, but is something 
happening? Are we raising awareness somehow? Well, there are two organizations that um, our families really depend on, and the first one is the um, Muscular Dystrophy Association, mm -hmm. which most people have heard about because mm -hmm. of the fundraising on Labor Day weekend. They're doing lots of research on neuromuscular diseases, mm -hmm. over 40, and SMA is one of those mm -hmm. diseases. So that holds out hope mm -hmm. that a cure, a treatments and cure will come. And then they also have clinics and hospitals that some patients take advantage of. And then they have a summer camp. So, Hum, would you like to talk about summer camp? <laughs> nope. Well, nope. the kids absolutely love it. They have all kinds of activities going on. And I've heard many of them say it's the best week of their life. They have a personal counselor who spends the whole week with them and knows their um, physical limitations mm -hmm. and treatments and so forth and they, the counselor even sleeps with them. Right and the, good, and the great thing about the, the camp is the counselor is also like a, like a student or a high school student or a college student who just is volunteering his or her time basically and taking the time and the effort to know the child, know their needs and try to make them have the best time of their life. So it's, mm -hmm. it's an amazing experience for the kids. And you mentioned the, a second the organization. The second organization is that's very dear to all of our right. hearts is the Family of Spinal Muscular Atrophy. This organization started in 1984, uh, just parents who needed support and comfort and educating themselves about what this disease was all about. But it's grown into an extensive network um, for, of support and research. FSMA has spent over $55 million dollars on research and a lot. and we really believe the cure will come. Yes. We're, we're, we're waiting and we hope it's the, soon. The cure should come very soon. Yes, <laughs> yes. we all yes. agree with that. So, um, and, and Families of SMA also has conferences. Mm -hmm. They have an annual conference which is marvelous. It's for researchers, um, adults, children, and family members. Yes. And uh, it's wonderful to come together. They spread it, they move it across the U.S. So if families are not able to fly, every few years there's a conference within driving distance mm -hmm. for them. But the researchers love to meet the patients because now they know who they're working for. And I think it gives them an impetus to go back and work even harder. Yeah. And parents, we love to pick their brains. What, what's happening? What are you finding? When is that cure right. coming? And the kids have a ball in the kids' room. So it's a, a really great time for the family. And you said researchers, so what research is happening and are there yeah, any let, let me, uh, drugs? Or? Yeah, let me answer that briefly. Well, of course, the purpose of any SMA research is to develop drugs that hopefully will eventually cure this disease. But the problem is drug development is very expensive. Pat mentioned that, S that FSMA has invested $55 million in research, and that's over several years. But to carry a drug through FDA clinical trials approval to approval can cost tens of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And so what Families of SMA does is invest in, in very important seed research to motivate drug companies who have the dollars to invest to invest in this development process. So in other words, they give a little bit of money to start the research. They, they actually do some of the basic research that's needed for people to make a decision to make a larger investment ah, to develop okay. a drug. For example, some of the early uh, research that FSMA completed was defining the genetics of this disease, that which I referred mm -hmm. to as we opened the program. Uh, they develop models to test potential drug candidates. More recently, they're identifying compounds to make drugs. And also, to they're currently working on defining biomarkers that can very quickly and accurately measure the impact of a, of a drug. And this can hopefully accelerate the process through the approval cycle at FDA. So let's look at this graphic right here. FSA currently has 15 drugs in their development pipeline. Now that's significant because statistically only about 10% of these will ultimately clear their way through FDA clinical trials and mm. be approved for distribution. Now that's really significant because only 10 years ago there was just one line on this chart. Wow. <laughs> and so we are making progress. We're not there yet, but there's certainly hope for a cure. 
that, and that's almost what, there. Exactly, <laughs> yes. we're almost there, and that's what we're hoping for, and that's why we do the fundraising. And what fundraising type activities are happening in the Bay Area? Well, right in San Francisco Bay Area, there are several fundraising opportunities. Mm -hmm. Two of them I want to mention is Concert for a Cure, which happens every spring. It's an auction, dinner, and just a really fun evening for everyone. And then our walk and roll I'm very involved in, and that happens in August in uh, Golden Gate Park. And we love to get together as family and friends and walk together, have entertainment and lunch. And um, we love for other people to join. So if, if you're interested in these events, um, write down the information you see on your screen and we would love to hear from you and have you join us. Yeah, it's, right. a, it's a lot of fun. It's been going, this is going to be the 12th, 12th year. year. 12th year. Yes. Yeah, we walk started it when Jessica was just one year right. old. So and it's exciting to have it continue this it many grew, years later. Actually. It, it grew, actually. It grew bigger and better. <laughs> so that's good. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the, I know we're going to be closing soon, but if you have any last thoughts or what, what have you learned from the experience of having SMA in your family? What? We learned that we should blend in. Blend in? Okay. Blend in, okay. Um, I think we learned a lot of things, good lessons learned. And the best thing I think I've learned over the years, it's been over a decade now, is to take things in stride and take, you know, enjoy the little moments, enjoy the little joys of your life. Um, that's that's actually our like a motto in our family. If you're having a great day, make the most of it, enjoy it. If you're having a bad day, let's face it and get through it. So I think taking one day at a time that I really learned dealing with SMA or living with SMA. Mm -hmm. When Madison was first diagnosed, we were just devastated because we'd never heard of this disease. How could it hit our family? Right. Um, and now we hear it's hereditary. We had no idea mm -hmm. that that happened. But we've seen Madison grow. Yes, she has limitations, but she also has such strengths and she's such a joy to have in our family. Yeah, right. Jessica was such a joy in my life and I try to continue to share her joy with everyone that I meet. And we had a wonderful show and I want to thank you all for being here and thank you for tuning in to AAUW Connections. Yay!